the best of life. You say, my dear Anushka, that you have nothing but your dreams. You are full of dreams, drunk every day with ideals. And you speak of this as if it were a weakness, something to be ashamed of. You are young, all your years slant upward. Before you, life stretches out as a vast, untried adventure. Love is yet to come, and success and a career. Let me, who am over the hill crest and on the westering slope, talk to you a bit. And looking back on all that I have had and felt and lived, let me say to you that the best of all was the dream. Not what I got, but what I longed for. Not what I attained unto, but what I aimed at. These are my harvest, my treasures. I fished in the sea, but the biggest fish got away. I hunted in the wood, but the brightest birds, the fleetest deer, were those I glimpsed and saw as they vanished. The things I have seen, gazed at with full vision, were cheap and tawdry compared to those that flashed by and were caught only by the tail of my eye. What I have done is a poor compromise. What I dreamed of doing was wonderful. I have composed music such as the angels might covet to sing. I have painted pictures, carved statues, built palaces such as no hands of flesh could accomplish. I have said words that broke hearts with their infinite tragedy, and healed them again with their divine accent of consolation. I have written books that swayed the world's heart as the summer wind bends the wheat field. But it was all in the realm of might have been, beyond the mountains of the possible. This real self I am afraid for you to know, it is so commonplace. I am just a man, and the worse for wear. I am not a bit splendid nor dazzling, but by way of being shopworn. It is only my beautiful secret that comforts me to take of what I dreamed. It is only this that encourages me to take my journey hopefully among the stars when my release comes. Perhaps there, in some cosy planet among the Pleiades, or dwelling as a pure flame among the fire spirits that play about the petals of Dante's Rose of Heaven, perhaps there I shall find a pot of gold at the end of my rainbow. But as far as this earthly career is concerned, Anushka, the rainbow has been more worth than the gold. Yet I am not sad nor disillusioned, for, listen, I still have my dreams, my skies of maybe still overarch with infinitude my earth that is. What I have is pitiful enough, ah, but what I thought I was getting. I am as one who gathers shells and sea beauties, and takes them home, and finds them withered, yet remembers the day on the shore. You recall what the poet said? I wiped away the weeds and foam, I fetched my sea, born treasures home, but the poor unsightly, noisome things had left their beauty upon the shore with the sun and the sand and the wild uproar. So hold your dreams, Anushka, and never let them go, for when you are old, they will be the best residue of life. Use and Beauty The Sabbath, said the teacher, was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. The bearings of which, as Dickens would say, is in its application. Any institution was made for man, and not man for the institution. The college, for instance. No, friend Procrustes, whilst we appreciate your zeal to make a record for yourself as president, yet we would remind you that we are sending our boy to your university for the good he can get out of it, and not for the benefit he can be to it. He is not there for you to find out how far he falls short of your standards, nor what glory he can add to his alma mater. He is there for you to find out what's in him, and to develop that. We don't care a hang about your grand old traditions and things, except as they help you in being the making of our particular pup. The church was made for man, and not man for the church. And if your meeting house is just occupied in keeping itself up, parson, why, close it up and start a henry, and help Hoover. We don't care about how much money you raise, nor how beautiful are your vestments, nor how high your theology, nor how numerous your membership, nor how gay your stained glass. 
Are you helping friend man? Are you making him sober, industrious, clean, and honest? Are you developing in him a civic conscience? Or are you simply being good? So good, you're good for nothing. Come, produce, or quit. The house was made for man, Ma, and not man for the house. Let the boys play marbles in the dining room, and the girls have their beer in the parlour, and Grandpa smoke his pipe in the kitchen, and everybody raid the icebox at 11pm if they want to. What better use can carpets be put to than that children's knees should wear them out a glee making? And what are sofas for if not for spooning? And kitchen warmth and cheer if not for old folk homing? Use the old home up and get a better product of love and laughter and undying memories. Books were made for man and not man for books. Use them, thumb them, mark them, go to bed with them, carry them on trains. And don't own books that cannot be carried down through the valley of every day as the soul's lunch basket. The most perfect ornament is that which is of the most perfect service to man. No cane is so beautiful as the one grandfather wore smooth on a thousand walks. No chair so lovely as that one mother consecrated by many a night of rocking the baby. No table so priceless as that one where father used to write. No pipe so pretty as the one he smoked, no dress so charming as that one that still has the wrinkles in it worn there by the little girl gone, gone forever into heaven or womanhood. It's the human touch that beautifies. Nothing can be warmly beautiful that is not or was not useful. And democracy is beautiful because it exists for the welfare of the people that compose it, and not for the glory of the dynasty that rules it. The state was made for man, and not man for the state. The Ethics of Controversy Everything is disputable. I am willing to entertain arguments in support of any proposition whatsoever. If you want to defend theft, mayhem, adultery, or murder, state your case, bring on your reasons. For in endeavouring to prove an indefensible thing, you discover for yourself how foolish is your thesis. But it is essential to any controversy, if it is to be of any use, first, that the issue be clearly understood by both sides. Most contentions amount merely to a difference of definition. Agree, therefore, exactly upon what it is you are discussing. If possible, set down your statements in writing. Most argument is a wandering from the subject, a confusion of the question, an increasing divergence from the point. Stick to the matter in hand. When your adversary brings in subjects not relevant, do not attempt to answer them. Ignore them, lest you both go astray and drift into empty vituperation. For instance, President Wilson in the Lusitania incident called the Germany's attention to the fact that her submarines had destroyed a merchant ship upon the high seas, the whole point being that this had been done without challenge or search, and without giving non-combatant citizens of a neutral country a chance for their lives. Germany's reply discussed points that had no bearing upon this issue, such as various acts of England. Mr. Wilson, in his reply, wisely refused to discuss these irrelevant things, an example of intelligent controversy. Keep cool. The worse your case, the louder your voice. Be courteous. Avoid epithets. Do not use language calculated to anger or offend your opponent. Such terms weaken the strength of your position. A controversy is a conflict of reasons, not of passions. The more heat, the less sense. Keep down your ego. Do not boast. Do not emphasize what you think, what you believe, and what you feel but try to put forth such statements as will induce your opponent to think, believe, and feel rationally. Wait. Give your adversary all the time he wants to vent his views. Let him talk himself out. Wait your turn, and begin only when he is through. Agree with him as far as you can. Give due weight and a little more to his opinions. It was the art of Socrates, the greatest of controversialists, to let a man run the length of his rope, that is, to talk until he had himself seen the absurdity of his contention. Most men argue simply to air their convictions. Give them room. 
Often, when they have fully exhausted their notions, they will come gently back to where you want them. They are best convinced when they convince themselves. Avoid tricks, catches, and the like. Do not take advantage of your opponent's slip of the tongue. Let him have the impression that you are treating him fairly. Do not get into any discussion unless you can make it a sincere effort to discover the truth, and not to overcome, outtalk, or humiliate your opponent. Do not discuss at all with one who has his mind made up beforehand. It is usually profitless to argue upon religion, because as a rule, men's opinions here are reached not by reason, but by feeling or by custom. Nothing is more interesting and profitable, however, than to discuss religion with an open-minded person, yet such a one is a very rare bird. If you meet a man full of egotism or prejudices, do not argue with him. Let him have his say, agree with him as you can, and for the rest, smile. Controversy may be made a most friendly and helpful exercise, if it be undertaken by two well-tempered and courteous minds. Vain contention, on the contrary, is of no use except to deepen enmity. Controversy is a game for strong minds. Contention is a game for the weak and undisciplined. Letting things alone. There are times, said Ebb Hopkins, when you want to let things alone, and then again there are times when you want to meddle. I lean mostly to letting him alone myself. As I get older, I notice that most things sort of cure themselves if you leave them lay. I used to butt in frequent when young, but since I passed the draft age, I kind of lost my taste for fixing things. I suppose they some would call me a coward, and a sidestepper, and an opportunist, and a trimmer, and all that. I don't know, maybe I am. But I've had my eye on old Mr. Time for lo these many years, and I've observed that, as a mender of bones, hearts, political differences, and religious quarrels, he is like A. Ward's kangaroo, seldom equaled and never surpassed. The way to teach a boy how to swim is to throw him into the water and go away. Then he has to learn right off. There was an old man Eustace and his wife over Sanford Way that had no end of trouble over their boy. They was always working with him and lecturing him and wrestling in prayer over him, and he was just carousing and acting up all the time. Till the old folks up and died, and then there was nobody cared a whoop for the boy, whether he hung himself or not, and he had the first good spell a letting alone he'd ever had in his life and he just turned right around and straightened up, and now he owns a bank, and is deacon in the church and everything. Of course, you can't always let things alone, but in case of doubt, it's trumps. So I read history, it seems to me that letting folks alone has been the secret of the success of the English-speaking peoples. Government control of everything, from wheat cakes to railroads, may be coming, and it may be best, but I'm personally a little skittish of it. The English race's idea of law and government is to have as little of them as possible. The German idea is to have everything and everybody regulated, down to drawing their breath. And they're trying it out now, to see which idea will whip. The Almighty does a heap of letting folks alone. Anybody can go to the dogs that wants to. The gates of the bad place are open day and night. It looks to me very much as if what saves a man must come from the inside of him. And if he ain't got nothing inside that will rouse up and save him, he ain't worth saving. And nature is anxious to shovel him out in the discard just as soon as possible. So I says, let him alone. The good ones will come to the top, and the bad ones will drown, and they'll make fertilizer, and perhaps that's what they're intended for. Thus spake Ebb Hopkins. The Pleasures of Outlawry the hand of civilization has lain hard upon those professions wherein the outlaw spirit once found expression. The rip-roaring pirates have been swept from the seven seas. Bandits have been chased from the mountains. Robbers no longer infest the woods, and smugglers have deserted the caves. About all that is left for the poor wicked man is the gypsy bands in the country and the criminal class in the city. Too little attention has been given to that primeval and persistent trait of human nature, the love of outlawry. 
that it is in the blood of all of us is shown by the fact that it breaks out in every boy. No boy wants to be a banker or a grocer when he grows up. They all want to become pirates, bandits, or circus clowns. They are supposed to get over this as they mature, but a lot of it still lingers under the vests of the most respectable members of society. It is doubtful whether any human being wants to sin. What he wants is to escape from respectability. Few men drink liquor for the love of it. A vast deal of alcohol is consumed just because it seems devilish. When the host tips his guest the wink and stealthily leads the way to the back closet under the stairs and produces a black bottle, how the flavour of the liquor is improved by the vicious delight in evading the watchfulness of the members of the Women's Temperance Society gathered in the parlour. Few boys would learn to smoke if it were not impressed upon them that smoking perverts their morals and brings them to an early grave. For just the wild waywardness of doing something desperate, they will sneak behind the barn and make themselves sick with father's pipe. How many a marriage has gone wrong because of the irrepressible desire of human beings to make moral excursions might be an interesting subject for speculation. There is a cantankerous rebellion in the average human being toward anything that is legalized, even ecstatic bliss. The criminal class is supposed to be confined to a few lowbrowed persons well known to the police. But all criminality does not lie within this coral. There are propensities in all of us that differ but little from those in the professional lawbreaker.